Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, an introduction to forest road design. For those of you here in the live version of the webinar, please you know, engage with us throughout the webinar. You can enter your questions in the Q&A section of your GoToWebinar panel. We will tackle those at the end. So let's get into it. Now, forest roads are an essential part of forest harvesting operations. Their location and construction have significant impacts on harvest efficiency, operational costs, and on environmental impact. They are also one of the most expensive elements in timber harvest operations. RoadEng, forest engineer, presents your spatial data and your proposed roads as 3D surfaces. This is geometric road design, and that's what we're going to be covering today. Geometric road design has some pretty huge benefits. We can view a proposed road and see the vertical and horizontal alignments and how they interact with the surrounding terrain. We can see the cross-section geometry and how it interacts with the surrounding terrain. And with both of these elements, we can improve road safety and reliability. Users can customize road prism dimensions and adjust alignments so that they can capture uh, geotechnical, drainage, and safety specifications. And we can make sure that we're meeting the road design standards in particular with curve design. And a lot of that is done just through a, through, uh, through a few settings in the software. We can also look at the geometry and placement of culverts and other drainage structures, uh, how they interact with the road's geometry and the surrounding terrain. We can calculate the total earthwork required for that road, uh, as well as its associated costs. And lastly, we can improve construction communication with output sheets. Now, design output sheets provide clear documentation, communicating quantities and expectations with the construction crew. Uh, so all of these are some of those you know, main benefits of doing geometric road design. Uh, there's a whole bunch more. I'm sure that uh, Matt, who's going to be taking over from me here in a second, uh, can you know, show you a few more of them. In terms of today's introduction, uh, we are going to be covering a few concepts, uh, the first of which is how to import a preliminary alignment and your own TAPA data. Uh, and this is going to be coming from GIS. So we're going to look at that uh, import, then we're going to take that preliminary alignment and show you how to create a geometric road design from it. We'll calculate our quantities for construction, plan our culverts and our drainage structures, create some output sheets, and then at the end, we'll show you how to take that final alignment uh, back out of the software as a sheet file. So with that, I am going to pass it over to our resident training expert, webinar master, uh, Matt, and he is going to yeah take us into the software. Thanks for the introduction, Aaron. And uh, yeah, a um, little preamble stuff on my end. Um, today's example, it's a fictional example. I just pulled a... Uh, uh, a few files off publicly available sources um, and the example today is going to be geared towards working closely with the uh, GIS software. Um, it, road design is one of those things you can tackle it a bunch of different ways, uh, not saying this is the exact way to do it, um, but it gives you a, a pretty good workflow to use. Uh, if you're not uh, extremely familiar with road design, um, if you're coming from just planning your roads uh, as a line on a map, um, as Aaron introduced, we're going to cover a few things that might be uh, new. So big thing is dealing with design speeds, so as Aaron said, curves. Um, so we'll assume our design today is a 50 kilometer an hour road, and uh, for that, the big things are that our radius, we want to keep that radius. Uh, above 100 meters, and then uh, vertical curves will be, have a gay value of 11 or 12. Uh, earthworks will deal with uh, figuring out how much dirt we have to move and shape that into a road. Um, so if you're used to planning your roads as just a, a line on a map, um, this will have a lot of value from a planning perspective. So, uh, of course, building 100 meters of road in one place might be different than building 100 meters of road in another. Uh, the big drivers for your costs, construction effort, are going to be how much dirt you're handling and how far you're moving it. Um, yeah, so we'll jump right into it. 
I'm going to start by opening up Terrain, so our software is modular. Uh, terrain we're going to build the surface to design from. I'm also going to use a few separate instances of Terrain to add in shape files and whatnot to use as a background so I can see uh, what's going along on uh, in the vicinity of where we're going to place a road. Uh, so we're doing that in Terrain. And then we're going to jump over to location, and location is going to be where we design our linear infrastructure. Uh, in this case, a in-block forest road. All right. So new instance of train. I'm just going to start out by inserting my file. And <laughs> I think you've got your other screen showing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's okay. I think everyone was probably wondering, <laughs> wondering where the instance of terrain was. Well, we, uh, we didn't great. miss anything uh, too earth-shattering there, so all I've done is open up uh, terrain. All right, so in terrain, I'm going to click Insert File. Um, so this is one of those things that you can uh, approach from a variety of different ways. Uh, we can deal with traditional survey data. We can deal with traverse data. Uh, we can deal with raw LiDAR data, so LAS files, point cloud format. Um, if you work with GIS a lot, though, you're probably used to dealing with that uh, information as a, a raster. So we've got our DEM here. So I've got my DEM. It's just in TIFF format. I'm going to click Open. I can choose whether that TIFF comes in as an image or a DEM. So obviously we want it to be a DEM. We'll hit OK. Uh, the projection. The projection is carried with that TIFF file, so I don't have to do anything on my end here. We'll hit OK. To take a moment to bring that in. So the file is brought in, and one of the boxes I had ticked there uh, is to create a uh, tin surface on import. So it's creating the surface right now in the background. Uh, another item that I had ticked was uh, I don't want to display my uh, points. So once this is done calculating my surface, I'm probably going to get a bunch of uh, magenta points show up, and then when I click away, they're going to disappear. So those points are in my model. I just don't care to look at them because they're not really telling me anything important. So there's those magenta points. I don't want to see them. I'm just going to click off to the side. Now, if I click the 3D view, this is going to take a moment to, to render. Uh, but since the tin is already made, we don't have to come up here and uh, click train modeling, then generate, and then create our surface. Uh, for this example today, I'm also going to uh, work without generating contours in our software. So since we're working with GIS software, a lot of folks in GIS like to work with a hill shade. So we can uh, bring that hill shade in, image in and uh, use that as a, a reference for where things are at. So this 3D surface is almost made. And this is just a, a matter of uh, wanting to see where things are at. And there's the example of the topography that we're dealing with. So that's that. Now I'm going to hit save. So we've got a surface. That's all we need to really design with. Uh, but a lot of the times there's other things that you want to consider. So I'm going to save this as topo. And we'll reference this topo file in our uh, design. Before we do that, I'm going to create a few more train files uh, with the other information that I want. So another instance of train, insert file. Uh, I've got DM derivatives. I'm going to grab my hillshade. It's just a TIFF file. And this I want to look at it as, as an image. There that is. And we'll save this. All right. Now, actually, another thing. Uh, so we're working with a TIFF. It's an image. If you have your own uh, high-res ortho images, uh, you can bring those in um, yourself. If you don't have high-res ortho images you'd like to use, or you find it more convenient to work off of the imagery from Google Earth or Bing, uh, we can select a feature, reference feature. Since our coordinate system is defined, uh, we can use our live maps and pull the imagery off Google Earth, Bing, or Map Tyler. I'm not going to bother with this in uh, this case. It takes a moment to download. That's that. 
Uh, so in another instance of a terrain, so we've got our hill shade, which is just an image. We've got our topo surface, which is a DEM. And it's also pretty common to want some sort of uh, uh, shape file for context where things are at. So let's go with the uh, proposed blocks. I'm going to add that into a terrain file. Projections. Oh. Let's go with uh, set our projection for this one. Uh, 2193, is it? Nope. I'm just making sure I uh, work in the same projection as my other files. So there's my blocks. Of course, they come in pretty plain. I'm going to change how they're displayed. I hit uh, Control L to bring up that. That's just out of habit because I've used the software for a long time since before this uh, properties panels over here, and we can also adjust things over here. Um, so let's make the boundary red. Uh, we can also add some hatching if that is something we want. Uh, what option do we want for hatching? We'll go with light dots. And just so things don't get fizzy, I'm actually going to turn off that hatching. All right, so we are good to go. I'm going to hit File, Save As. Uh, you can add a bunch of different shape files into the same terrain file. Uh, it depends how you go about uh, your thought process and planning. Um, I like to have my different shape files on different terrain files so I can toggle them on and off separately uh, in location. So I'm just going to save this as block. And I just realized I forgot to do something in my topo. Uh, so we can design from the topo as is. Uh, but if we have a preliminary alignment that we want to reference, um, we can add that in. So our uh, initial alignment and location is a duplication of that. Uh, Proposed road. And there's our proposed road to start with. So I'll hit save. Um, a little bit of a cooking show approach. I've got a bunch of other terrain files that I'm going to use for backgrounds and add them in to have things like water courses and existing roads and whatnot in there. And let's go to location. All right, so in location, um, we don't want to go file open. Uh, location's working in a different uh, format than uh, terrain. So we're going to go file new, and we're going to reference that terrain surface. So browse, grab the topo. Oh, we can't open it up quite yet because it's still saving, I think. I think it's done now. So that's just being referenced. And here uh, we get to choose what our initial alignment looks like. So most of the time, uh, it's personal preference, most of the time, even if I have a preliminary alignment uh, I want to base my design off of, I'll just start uh, with a single point, click it in by hand. Um, for this one, we've got our proposed alignment. We can select that from our list. So we've got our, uh, well, return hidden features on. We've got all our features in that terrain file that we can pick from. And we've got our proposed route. So we'll go with that. We'll hit next. We'll keep our standard default template. And there we are. Oh, now. Things look funny. Uh, I've got some elevation data assigned to that road, apparently. Um, so I could manually move up those points. I'm not going to do that, though. I'm just going to delete all my profile points. Now, another thing we can see over in my plan view is we don't have much of a context for what's going on. So I'm going to right-click in my plan, and I'm going to add the uh, backgrounds. So first, we'll go with our hillshade. We'll add that in. 
Um, then let's add in our block. So there is a draw order here uh, with the hill shade being an image. Uh, if we put that below our block, um, that's going to be, uh, it's going to be drawn over top of our, our block feature so we won't be able to see what's going on. The opposite of arc, I believe, by for default settings. Um, and then let's grab a few more backgrounds that are already made. So add buffers, existing block roads, public roads, streams, water bodies wetlands and we'll shift the wetlands up above the stream so we can see where the streams come through. Right, okay. It's just thinking for a moment. Oh, uh, just while we have a, a brief lull here, one thing that a uh, when Aaron was going over some of the benefits, uh, one of the real nice things about designing with a, a design software where you can see everything in 3D and how they interact and uh, the different views is it's going to uh, really reduce your uh, time spent wandering around in the woods, uh, figuring out where things should go. If you put together a decent preliminary design uh, in the office, usually your, your field review is a matter of is there anything I didn't capture? Um, not so much, uh, where should we put this road? So I'd expect this to be pretty close once we get done. So here we've got our plan view. We've got our different shape files uh, showing the background. We've got our hill shade. Our profile is just showing us the draped line, so it's not showing us the cuts and fills right now. And our cross section is showing us the uh, default cross section geometry. So I'm going to leave the default cross section geometry, but we can customize it in our template editor dialog. Really give you whatever you want. If you want to add in retaining walls or bench cuts, we can cover that. Uh, roadside barriers, etc. It's uh, all in there, but most of the time a forestry road you'll be dealing with this or something similar to this. All right, so we talked about curves starting out. Well, let's add some curves to our design. So we've got our horizontal curves panel. Uh, if yours isn't right here, you can access it over here. So horizontal curves, vertical curves, culverts, etc. And we'll just cycle through and add a 100 meter radius curve where we think we want one. go with the existing IPs that came over from the shape file. Um, so we can go through and add these one by one. Uh, we can tweak their location by pulling around the IPs. So I just click, right clicked, added an IP tool. I can move those around. The nice thing is we're going to see in the different views how that affects our alignment. Um, and if things that look half decent, we can just go through and fit the default curve to all our IPs. Save bunch of clicking. So we did that. There's a few IPs where the curve isn't applied. That's just because the default doesn't fit. So I'm going to move this over. And I'm just going to rough it in for now. I'm going to cheat here in a moment and use our, our optimizer for a few things. But, um, yeah, so we've got something that looks reasonable uh, based off the, the shapefile that was produced in the GIS software. Uh, here we're missing an IP, and that's because we've got two, or a curve, because we've got two IPs stacked on top of each other. So I'm just going to delete one of those. Oops. And let's apply our curve there. And curve there. So I'm just jumping to the, the different vertices to add my curves. So there. My road has a bunch of curves in it that support traffic traveling 50 kilometers an hour. Um, so that's pretty intuitive in the, in the plan view. And really, right now, we haven't got too far outside of uh, this mapping. We've drawn a line. One thing 
did here that you won't be doing in other software is uh, uh, mapping software is adding curves. Um, but let's start looking at things in a bit more detail here for our uh, profile. So down here we have our mass hall. That's showing the surplus uh, or deficit of material as we continue along our road. I'm just going to start by clicking in a vertical alignment here. So going through. Now I can see here I've got a, a lot of fill. That's creating a deficit, a material deficit, which makes sense. We're filling, we need fill material to come from somewhere. Um, as far as curves, so road geometry, we'll apply those. Let's go sag 12, crest of 11. And we could manually play with these and get something that balances or close to, goes close to balance. And we can continue on along our alignment. And uh, just working by hand here, we can come up with a pretty good design uh, for telling where the operator um, or builder should be at station 100. You should be coming into a big, uh, big fill off the hump. Maybe we push this back a little bit. Um, so we've got something more balanced and that makes sense here. So we've got a surplus of material being built there and then we've got the deficit where it dips down below and we're balancing things out. So we've just got a little bit too much of a deficit there and then we're back up to balancing here. So we can continue on like that. Uh, we can come up with a pretty good uh, design by hand. Um, I mentioned earlier on, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to use our optimizer uh, just because it is faster uh, for this. So we've got the behavior of how things work. Uh, with our optimizer, I'm going to generate an alignment uh, to minimize my construction costs. I'm gonna assign a bunch of uh, rules or constraints um, so we don't end up with a, a road that trucks can't drive on. We'll make sure we have grades under a certain uh, number and our K values make sense. So away we go. And when I say K values, that's just for referring to the vertical curves. Uh, one thing here, I've got a, a big long flat section uh, here that uh, I'm assuming I don't want to be right on the ground. So this would be a pretty typical uh, constraint in uh, flat terrain where you want to overland it, you want to import fill material. Um, so got good drainage off your road, doesn't flood, doesn't sink in if it's a, a swamp, build a nice big footprint, um, et cetera. So I'm going to apply that constraint uh, from station or to station 2440 and we'll start our minimum fill back here coming off this hill. Let's do it at station 1630. I'm gonna go in here. Vertical alignment. Uh, so I'm just here vertical control telling it it can be 10 meters either side of uh, ground, which is more than enough. Uh, I'm gonna tell it to sample every 20 meters. And uh, for standards, uh, this fast curves, I'm gonna have a bunch of vertical curves butted up against each other. And uh, grades, plus or minus 10%, sure. Uh, gay value, uh, crest of 11, uh, sag of 12, works for me. Control points, uh, other than the minimum fill, which we're gonna assign elsewhere, I'm not gonna worry about that right now, uh, except for start of our alignment. So we're starting on an existing road, so let's assume we don't want to start the road in a, in a massive fill. Pits, we won't worry about. Uh, that's if there's a material deficit, we can allow it to borrow that material uh, adjacent to the road, so a pit, or if we have a material surplus, we can allow uh, add-in uh, waste sites. Uh, unit costs, so this is a relationship that the optimizer is going to use to minimize our costs. Uh, I'm just dealing with one material type for this design, so our overburden material. Uh, the computer's looking at our uh, earthworks and we're telling it that it's going to cost $12 a cubic meter to cut material. It's gonna cost $4 a cubic meter to place it. And then for movement, we've got that defined uh, in here. So we've got a, a 
per unit value for hauling and loading and uh, it'll break down the distances. We can play with these numbers to suit your actual uh, per unit costs um, and we've got some different controls there. We'll just leave that as default. And constraints, so this is where we'll add our minimum fill. So station 1630 to 2440 make that active and we'll give it a minimum depth of a meter. Uh, I don't think we'll worry about the rest. We've got that. We'll hit vertical optimization and it's going to take a minute to uh, do the calculations. So as right now it's doing a sampling and uh, once it's done we'll have a vertical alignment. Um, yeah, so if we have some interim questions, now would probably be a good time. Uh, once this yeah. is done, we'll... Oh, yeah, we've got one, uh, one or two here that perhaps we can tackle in this time, Matt. Uh, the first one, uh, which I did send the answer already to the participant, but worth sharing with everyone, is can we get the example files that you're showing in this webinar so they can go through on their own? And uh, I'm going to answer that one. So yes, we absolutely can share out this fictional example file along with our video recording. So please watch for the link to that uh, little file packet uh, in the follow-up email you get. Uh, next question um, is in terms of exporting back to GIS, and I think that's something that you are going to cover uh, yeah. in the future, but this one's around exporting uh, culverts and the road alignment back to GIS. Yeah, um, so we will do that uh, uh, shortly, just as a brief uh, uh, introduction to it. Uh, for going directly to a shapefile, um, we won't do that in location. We'll look at, to take an interim step and export our uh, alignment into uh, train and then from train we have the option to just export it as a shape. Um, for uh, culverts, if you want to, so when we take the shape file and uh, or alignment and take it over to uh, train, the culverts is going to be captured as a polygon, which is, there's a good chance you won't want that. Uh, there's also a good chance you want to track uh, some information associated with it. Um, so for that, uh, we have the option to create a data table, which has, we can assign it to have your X, Y, Z coordinates and include all the uh, pertinent information with it. So we can include culvert length, uh, culvert diameter, um, etc. And I think awesome. I was going to say we probably can tackle one more here while well, that's just finishing processing the cross sections. Uh, can we draw an alignment without adding terrain Terex files? Yes. Or, uh, so uh, that'll, that'll depend what you mean. Um, so if we want to just start from scratch uh, and draw in our own alignment, um, the normal way to do that would be to reference your terrain surface and uh, we don't have to have a shape file to base our alignment on. We can go from scratch with it. Uh, but usually you reference the terrain surface in that. If you don't have a terrain surface, um, we can work with Land XML uh, as well, so we can reference that directly. But that is, uh, uh, you'll need a software to create a Land XML file. Awesome. Um, okay, more questions here. Can you account for the use of geotextiles, uh, in particular their quantity and cost? Uh, yep, so uh, we could do uh, a few different things. Um, we could assign it in our templates and have uh, a really high per cubic meter cost in it and have just really thin. Uh, we could also add it in as a, an attribute in our table. And, uh, carry that as a, a cost and the ad, a custom attribute. I'll have to apologize here. I think I uh, <laughs> I grabbed a different shape than what I initially uh, did when I practiced this and it's a, a bit longer than what I uh, <laughs> planned to use so it is taking longer to calculate. That's totally okay Matt. A couple more <laughs> questions. Uh, the next one, so this optimizer that you're demonstrating, is it included in RoadEng? Uh, great question. Um, no it's not. So it is a software add-on. Um, it's uh, it's great. Um, <laughs> I 
design roads and it makes things a, a lot faster. Uh, it also makes it easy to do comparisons. Um, so it's really easy if you're not sure where to put the road uh, to hum and haw between some different options. And then even if you are doing a, a detailed cost estimate on those, uh, it's easy to do a really good job with one of the designs that you're comparing and then you, you'll just click something in fast so you don't really have the same level of effort to compare those options. Um, so with that, the optimizer is nice to standardize your effort as well as give you the, the road that costs the, the minimum amount. Nice. Uh, and another question actually related to optimization. Uh, what is a reasonable length of alignment to be optimized? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so the uh, there are two uh, levels to our optimizer. So right now I'm just using the uh, vertical optimization side of the software. Uh, so that, it can handle a lot longer than our horizontal optimizer. Uh, with that, uh, it's going to depend on how frequently you're sampling along your road. Um, but I, I wouldn't bat an eye at doing 10 or so kilometers or, or more. Um, yeah. I, I should know the, the cutoff for what's reasonable. Um, yeah, so it's pretty flexible. And then if you have to break it up into sections, it's easy to break it up into sections as well. Uh, for the horizontal optimizer, it, it works differently. So the vertical optimizer is generative. So we didn't need to click in uh, a new alignment at all. Um, the uh, horizontal optimizer isn't generative. So it's... Uh, built on the vertical optimizer, but we need a, a preliminary horizontal alignment because it works by adjusting where your uh, IPs, so vertices, are located and tweaking it back and forth to minimize your earthworks costs. Okay, let's tackle uh, one more here. Good job, by the way, audience. Keep the questions coming. It keeps yeah. Matt on his toes. Um, did you pre-format the imported shape files, or are those formats saved from GIS? Uh, I used, uh, so when I prepped for this, just to kind of avoid any bias of clicking something in so it works well with this, I, I formatted it with QGIS. So I started from scratch, clicked in a preliminary alignment in QGIS, I clicked in my block boundaries, and uh, away I went. Uh, awesome. So uh, something that blinked in the back there, uh, we're not, it's not doing the same thing as it was previously. Um, it did do an optimization, now it's just calculating the, the volumes associated with our design here. I was going to say, I don't think I've got time to squish in another question, so we'll just let this run out. But yeah, uh, yeah audience, keep typing them in. Uh, great work. There, so found a cost, found an optimal alignment. There's that. So as we can see, we have a bunch of curves here. And uh, where we're assigning the one meter minimum fill, we're adhering to that uh, constraint. If we zoom out, we've got a lot of... Uh, stuff going on there, but let's uh, do, 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 do a recalculation. So if you're paying close attention, it did calculate uh, when it did the optimization, but it's only calculating based on the sample efficiency or uh, frequency that I assigned in there. Um, so this is using all our, our report points. So there, if we zoom out, we can see our mass hall is balanced, so we don't have extra material or a surplus of material at the end. Uh, we've got this big negative slope here where we're dealing with our fill section. And then if we just look at this really quickly, uh, this is rising fairly gently. So I'm not too concerned about that. And then we can see we've got some big spikes in our mass hall diagram here showing us where we're generating material uh, to fill through that flat section. So we're doing it in a couple different spots, and depending on how you format uh, your optimization parameters, um, you can, it, uh, I kept it pretty simple, you can make it as complex as you want, um, and you can 
influence where things happen. So we could have added a borrow pit in here, and uh, we probably would have got a spike of material here and been closer to uh, tracking the existing ground back here. Um, one thing that I, I didn't mention that uh, uh, may not be obvious for some of you, and I'm just going to turn off one of my labels because that's cluttered, is uh, the scale in my profile. A lot of folks, when they're designing a profile, especially in flat or flatter terrain, it's nice to use a uh, exaggerated scale. So here I've got an uh, exaggeration of uh, a multiple of 10. If I go a one-to-one, -one, of course, everything looks really flat. It's hard to tell uh, what's what. So also hard to predict where water's going, etc. So. Let's go back here. Um, yeah, so we've got an alignment. Uh, da, 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 we'll add in culverts. So I'm just going to add in a report point. And I won't do all my culverts just because it's pretty repetitive. So here, if we want to pipe place in this location, I've got the culvert tool. I'll click add. I've got a 500 mil pipe added. Let's assume we want a 1,000 instead. We'll make it a natural channel. There we go. Now we can tweak our geometry to fit that because our pipe's poking out of the ground. Let's do a couple quick tweaks. So we've optimized the alignment, and this is just adding a little bit more realism to things. with a tighter curve there. There we go. We've got our pipe in there. We'll go back to our culvert. And, well, it's not lined up. So this is another nice thing about uh, dealing with uh, uh, geometric software. So a lot of the times, if you're just looking at your uh, culverts as a point, um, it's really easy to mess up the length. So, and that's especially true if you're dealing with big fills or heavy skews, et cetera. So let's, uh, this would be a place where I like to use the 3D view. I'm gonna add a couple options here. And this would look cooler if it was a, a big in size channel, but it's flat ground and a, a pretty uh, benign creek. So we'll add that. We'll also add in our culvert. So this is rendering the 3D surface for the topo in the background there. Um, so it'll take a moment. And then we can tweak our skew, we can adjust our pipe gradient, uh, we can uh, deviate with the length from the, the default settings. So right now it's set to an auto. Um, yeah, pretty uh, pretty uh, useful piece of, uh, piece of gear. And there we are. So we can see our pipe. Let's adjust the skew. I almost got it. So there we are. And of course here we've got uh, 7.5 and 7.5, that's just personal preference. Uh, don't like having people cut pipes at weird lengths if they don't have to. So we've got that in there. Um, as far as summaries go, we can create a data table that shows us a, a bunch of different information. I'll start out by just uh, summarizing our volumes here. So we'll do it in 100 meter intervals. We'll set our columns to include our volume data. So we'll go cut volume, fill volume, and then we've got a surfacing layer in our template. So we'll include both of those. And we'll go with design totals. 
So we can see we are, um, our values are pretty close to balancing there. And our surfacing, we've got 4,300 uh, cubic meters of uh, gravel placed on our road. That's not fixed. That's just a setting in our, our template. So if you're dealing with a, a dry season road, you wouldn't need surfacing and you wouldn't have to track it. But if you did track it, it would be easier there. Um, yeah, so we've got that. I'll grab another data table. Just view. New window, data, data options. So here, let's grab our culvert insertion points. And let's grab our uh, culverts. So if I want my culvert diameter, uh, culvert length, so that would be the big things for, for ordering. We can populate that. And we've just got one pipe in here at this time, so that, that makes sense. Um, as far as outputs go, we'll switch over so we can create a, a nice ANSI design really quick. We figured out our geometry uh, in the other windows. This is our multi-plot. Let's create a multi-plot output. So here I'm going to just grab a workbook that's already formatted from another project. I've got my plan view. It's just taking a moment. So I've got my plan profile on one sheet. I've got different tables showing me my earthwork summaries, curve summaries, colored summaries. And then I've got a, another uh, chapter, which is giving me my cross-section geometry. So that's really fast. Um, as promised, oh, so we'll do... We'll deal with that culvert question for exporting it as uh, into GIS software. So I've got data options, um, columns. Let's grab the X and Y. So that'll give us a point to read that in. So you can you can read that in, and now you can take that into Arc or whatever GIS software you're using and Take this table, export data to ASCII. So ASCII just being a text or CSV file, and you can read that in uh, to your uh, other software. Now, plan view, if I want my center line, I'm going to go File, Save As, Train, Center Line. And away we go. Uh, oh, I don't care about my cross sections. I don't care about model. So I've just got my entire length of road. I've only got one alignment in this design. Uh, I'm using all the points that are generating it along. And I'm just grabbing the linear feature, which is my center line. So that's getting opened in terrain. And here. We've got uh, save as, and we have an option for an extension for shape files here. Save as, choose what we want. So we could export all the points that make up that feature. We could export the polyline, um, and we could add attributes to it if we'd like as well. Uh, another thing just for the sake of while we're here and talking about shapes, uh, we could digitize our block or polygon feature. Just doing this really quick, obviously. So I've got a shape, a polygon, and uh, just close this to make sure it's closed. I'll save as, we'll call it block. And now I can choose my polygon. I've also got the option to choose the selected feature. So if I go with that, there's, and I had multiple polygons in there, but I only had one selected. Export the selected feature as a shape file. Um, yeah. Now I'm already quite a bit over in time. Uh, one thing I was going to do is just kind of show the benefits of uh, having all this information at your fingertips. Might do a little bit. Uh, but I'm not going to run the optimization for it. So here, for example, 
we can click through, see where see where things are at. If our road's in the best location, we could use the 3D view as well. I'm going to just minimize that though. So here, I'm down over the edge. Is that going to make it so I need a culvert where I wouldn't otherwise need it? Maybe. I'm on the crest there, so I think it's going to drain both directions, which is nice. Uh, as we come over here, oh, we can take a closer look at things. Really, there's not much. When I clicked this in in QGIS, I saw the, uh, the humpy bumpy ground in the hillshade. But uh, looking at this, and when you consider I've got a magnification of 10 on my scale, uh, there's not much relief. Um, so when I was designing this, I've decided I probably would want to. Uh, uh, move things over here. And this is just because I've got so many curves right now. I should have. Uh, bear with. There we go. So I would want to move that over there. Uh, I could make better decisions, of course. We're riding a ridge here now. Um, I'd move that over and uh, let's, I could probably start my overlanding back here, reduce the amount of fill. Um, so I, I did this in a, another version of this when I was practicing and since it took so long to calculate, I had a, a shorter design that ended right here before. Um, I'll just tell you the numbers. So we tweaked that, changed the description and we ended up making a decision that uh, saved us about $100,000. Cool. All right. Um, hey, thanks, Matt, uh, for covering a huge amount of content, which is no surprise why we went over. Um, so just to quickly recap for everyone, uh, we imported our prelim alignment and topo data that came in this case from QGIS. Uh, Matt demonstrated how to take that create a geometric road design. He did cheat a little bit in terms of the profile creation uh, using the optimizer, which is a separate feature that we can add alongside a road end license. Uh, he calculated his quantities for construction, showed us how to add culverts in, talked about output sheets, and we have another question actually about output sheets, Matt, that we'll come back to in a second. Uh, and then we showed you how to export back uh, to shapefile going through the terrain module. So, great chance if you have any lingering questions, punch them in. Um, yeah, we'll hang on here for, for a couple minutes and just answer a few additional ones and then everyone can go off on their way. So, one of the extra questions here is about uh, the output templates. Um, are there templates available that people can use instead of creating their own? Good, good question. Yeah, so putting together uh, the what you use for your standard uh, drawing package can be tedious um, and you don't have to start from scratch you don't have to start adding in the different views and uh, away you go so I'm just going to add in a new um, actually let's just yeah uh, so we can add in chapters so if you are starting from scratch uh, I've got my page size defined over here so a size D sheet um, and we can pull in uh, different chapters associated with a size D sheet that are pre-formatted for you. Uh, so let's just grab a plan profile from this. So that's off of our uh, online library. And you can customize whatever you'd like. And I should have mentioned that too. So if you've got a logo, we can change that to be what you'd like. Uh, you can also add in images. You can move these around, and then you can save it as a as your own after you've customized it the way you'd like. Awesome. Uh, why don't we tackle one more? Uh, did the optimizer automatically balance your mass haul? It did. Um, yeah. So it's uh, it doesn't always depending on what you put in there for uh, constraints um, and the well, for example, if you had a road that you told it you wanted to be in one meter fill the whole way, well, uh, 
it wouldn't balance it. You'd have a deficit there. It's going to track the ground as close as possible in that case to minimize the amount of fill that you need to bring in. Um, but it would have to generate uh, or address the material shortage somehow. So it would add a, uh, it would give you a warning that it's added a uh, uh, artificial pit probably at the start of your road that's addressing that deficit. Awesome. Pretty well, I think we're going to call it there. Thank you, everyone, for coming to today's webinar. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to send them to us. You can reach the Matt and the rest of our Softree support team at support at softree.com. And that's it. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, guys. Thanks for watching another Softree webinar. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel below or tell us that you like the video. Thanks for watching.